Okay. Uh, say good morning, everyone. Um, uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, today is a sep special <laughs> seminar uh, by Alexi. Uh, so um, I asked you to uh, introduce Alexi yesterday, but in case, uh, I'm going to introduce her again. So uh, Alexi is a faculty of UC Santa Cruz and uh, working on the observational cosmology. And she got a PhD at uh, Marseille Astrophysics Laboratory and worked at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and Cabri IPMU in Japan. And then she moved to the UC Santa Cruz uh, since 2016. So she is an astronomer, obviously, but she is also um, interested in climate uh, crisis. So today's special se seminar, she talk about the climate and a biodiversity crisis. Okay, yeah. please start. Oh, and also the people on the Zoom, uh, if you have any questions or if you find any trouble um, voice, like losing voice, then uh, please amuse and tell us. Okay, please start. Thank you so much everyone for taking the time for this really important topic. Um, this is a talk that I struggled to give in a short time frame, so it is a bit long. I tried to, I tried to cut it back yesterday, but I apologize, there's just a lot to say on this topic. Um, usually in talks, I'm fine people asking questions in the middle, but for this one, I'm going to ask for questions at the end so that I can uh, get through the material. And if you have any uh, feedback, I've given this talk several times now on how to make this more clear or succinct, I'll be, I'll be happy to hear that. Um, okay, so without further ado, why am I standing here today for the special seminar? Um, we've seen unprecedented fires across the world. California, we know this very well. In Greece, we've seen unprecedented heat across the world. Uh, we had the hottest July and August and September on record. The scientific uh, community called this absolutely gobsmacking bananas. Okay, anyone used that term in their paper before? My galaxy is gobsmacking bananas, right? This doesn't happen very often. Uh, we're totally off the charts in terms of temperature. Um, furthermore, uh, for their evidence, the highest temperature ever recorded in Death Valley. Estimated 60,000 heat-related deaths in Europe last year. Phoenix, record number of 110 Fahrenheit days. And the UN has declared the era of global boiling, not global heating. So 2023 was incredibly alarming, which is why I'm standing here today to talk to you. Uh, the planetary vital metrics have been uh, very concerning. So why am I here today? Because we are facing an unprecedented planetary, humanitarian, biodiversity crisis. And I think it's been clear that the effects have been underestimated and some people are thinking they may be accelerating. So the climate crisis is here today. It's not the thing that your kids have to worry about. It's the thing that you have to worry about. We all have to worry about. Uh, it's not tomorrow and it's, it's not the next generation. It's not 2100. As astronomers, we have an important message to convey to people, there is no planet B, okay? I teach this in a big class, undergrad class I teach, and when I start the class, I do a poll, and maybe 60%, 70% of students think we may, we're gonna move to Mars maybe in a, you know, 10, 20 years, maybe 80. So that this is something we need to talk about and clarify, right? We have one planet. We're not gonna move to exoplanets either. <laughs> so. We need nothing short of immediate and large-scale changes across our worldwide economic system. And I love this quote from Astro 2020. These are you know, the document guiding our field, uh, which says, ironically, even as we search for habitable worlds, our profession, the profession's carbon large footprint is decreasing the habitability of our own planet. Okay, I think those are really stark words. So the goals of this talk our, uh, first of all, it's an introductory level talk. If you're well versed in this topic, this isn't the talk for you. This is more introductory aimed at physicists and astrophysicists. It's a high level overview talk, uh, sort of to uh, bring you up to speed on the latest. If you're an expert, it's not for you. And I study dark matter and dark energy. You know, that's, that's what I'm qualified to stand up and speak about. I'm not qualified to talk about dark matter and dark energy in this sense, okay? So this is not my field of expertise. There are many questions you may have. I don't have the answers. I'm just telling you sort of the stuff that I have learned over the past few years. In particular, I want to cover key elements of the IPC synthesis report, because as a scientist, I think this is a really useful document to read and understand. It gives you the foundations to understand sort of what people are talking about. I've been leading Zoom-based guided readings of the IPCC. If you are interested, you can sign up on my website. 
we finished section one, and the next one I'm organizing is section two and three. Um, this is a hard topic to cover in an hour. Consider this a starting point. Um, okay. So this, these are the different sections we're going to talk about. Uh, so just sort of very briefly going over the physics and, and what we're talking about. I think many of you already know this, so I'm going to go with this fairly fast. Um, as astronomers, we can point to the fact that the Earth and the Moon are virtually the same distance from the Sun. Uh, but the moon is 120 degrees Celsius in the day and, and uh, minus 130 at night. So the reason the moon has such incredible temperature variations is because it does not have an atmosphere. So the atmosphere, and in particular the greenhouse effect, is a good thing. It regulates Earth's small temperatures and actually keeps Earth at about 14 to 15 degrees Celsius on average. Uh, without it, Earth would probably be a snowball. So the greenhouse effect of first order is a good thing. The problem is when we change it in a way that destabilizes the Earth's current climate conditions. So the physics of the greenhouse effect are well understood. There is no debate. This is, this is simple physics for astronomers. Um, the sun radiates in the optical, um, heats up the Earth. The Earth becomes warm, re-radiates that heat in the infrared. However, as that radiated heat escapes through the atmosphere, it encounters these molecules. There's different kinds of molecules. CO2 is the one that's most talked about over here, and it causes a rho vibrational transition. This transition re-radiates down here in the infrared, and this acts as a blanket trapping some of that heat back down onto the Earth. Now, in particular, this uh, wavelength, at this particular wavelength that CO2 absorbs, the water vapor in the air would not have absorbed it. So it's an excess effect above the greenhouse effect of water. Um, and we know this physics from astronomy because we use these, uh, for example, the CO rotational spectra to study protoplanetary disks. And there are other molecules that have greenhouse effect too, methane, water, and CO2. But in particular, we are destabilizing the equilibrium by adding a lot more CO2 and a lot more methane. So why do we often talk more about CO2 than some of the other greenhouse gases? Particularly problematic because it's the largest contribution and it stays in the atmosphere the longest. So methane has a very strong um, global warming potential. So methane is very bad for warming the atmosphere, but it has a lifetime of about 12 years. So it will eventually disappear. Whereas CO2 has a very long lifetime and can last in the atmosphere for hundreds to you know, thousands of years. And so that's the problem. Once it's out in the atmosphere, it doesn't get destroyed. And so we would have to take it out again. Um, OK, so methane is a smaller part of the pie, but it's something that people are now starting to actively talk about because we are so late in addressing this problem. People are realizing that we also really need to tackle the methane problem. So what are we doing? Essentially, by burning these fossil fuels, coal and petrol, uh, this was carbon that was stored in the atmosphere millions of years ago. That carbon was sequestrated underground via um, life and decaying plant matter and decaying um, animals that took that carbon out of the air and put it back, put it underground. So we are essentially on a very short time scale taking CO2 from the Earth's past atmosphere and returning it to the atmosphere. So the Earth has gone through many different stages, which we'll talk about, but we are re returning to an era of the dinosaurs. And the thing that is very important to emphasize is that, yes, the Earth has gone through many different changes, the Earth's atmosphere has gone through many changes, but the pace at which this is happening over, you know, 100-year timescales is completely unprecedented in the history of the Earth, okay? Volcanoes don't change the Earth's atmosphere that fast. So temperature and CO2 in the Earth's history have varied in the past. OK, so this is a graph of temperature going up and down over the Earth's history. And uh, we can look at CO2, and they vary together. OK, CO2 and temperature are correlated. And this is a function of time. So. Uh, What's important to note over here, the uh, modern humans have evolved under the very stable conditions that exist over here for the past 11,000 years over here. Our temperature has been incredibly stable, and this is correlated with the emergence of modern agriculture and modern humans. Okay, so we have benefited from these incredibly stable conditions. Um, but it's important to note that humans have lived sustainably on Earth for millions of years prior to the great acceleration that led us to the point we are today. So the fact that 
humans um, are living unsustainably on Earth is not necessary. This hasn't been the case for millions of years. So I want to give you some idea of the range of temperatures that we're talking about. So during the last, last, last ice age over here, about 25,000 years ago, the temperature was about minus 6 degrees lower than it is today. And at the time of the dinosaurs here, about 65 million years ago, there were crocodiles living in the Arctic and deserts along the equator. That was roughly plus 4 degrees with a lot of variation and uncertainty. OK, so that, that's kind of the time of the dinosaurs. Now, the temperatures that we are talking about, sort of the range that's in the Paris Accord, which I'll talk about shortly, these are our goals, like do not go past this limit. We talk about 1.5 degrees and really absolutely don't go beyond 2 degrees. So in this context, you know, 2 degrees may not seem like a lot, but when you put it in the context of the Earth's natural range of minus 6 to plus 4, you realize that this is indeed a large variation. And, you know, the, we're, we're not going back to the <laughs> Ice Age, but we are going back to the dinosaurs. So uh, astronomers use Mauna Kea a lot. Uh, the other volcano on Hawaii is well, very, very famous for climate science because um, Mauna, Lea, on Mauna Loa Observatory have been measuring CO2 in the atmosphere since the 1950s. And as a result of these measurements, uh, this is called the Keeling curve. So this is a function of time. And this is atmospheric content of CO2 measured in parts per million, ppm. Um, and what you see here is that this curve has steadily been going upwards. And this is true since the pre-industrial era out here, since uh, 18, 1880 or something. Um, now, these little wiggles up and down, these are seasonal variations due to the effects of plants, respiration, photosynthesis. So that is well understood. But the mean is clearly increasing. And what this graph sort of tries to highlight is failures and lost opportunities of failed action on behalf of humans. So here we have uh, various IPCCs, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Accord, and you know this graph just goes up. Um, but we are at a point now where emissions need to go to net zero on very short timescales. Um, why have we failed to turn this curve? Basically, because we have a fossil fuel addiction. And you look around you, <laughs> there's no doubt about it. We all drive here, we get on planes, we travel, we eat food that's being transported. Um, and fossil fuels are cheaper than soda, which is just mind boggling. The other thing that creates our addiction is that one gallon of gasoline is the worker equivalent of 400 hours of an adult. Okay, so you want to give up a gallon of petrol, you need to have the same lifestyle, 400 hours of a person doing that labor. So these are the greenhouse gas, and gas emissions by sector, and this is a big part of the problem. The greenhouse gas emissions come from all sectors of the economy. So like you can just say, uh, oh no, let's tackle transportation and we're done. Okay, it's all it's a whole modern lifestyle that leads to these greenhouse gas emissions. To give an example, COVID uh, was a shutdown of you know worldwide economy, no flying, no going anywhere. That was a 5% reduction in greenhouse gas emission. And uh, that was about 2.5 gigatons of CO2. And so this highlights the magnitude of the problem flying. We definitely need to be flying less, but that's not enough. The magnitude of the problem is much, much bigger. Um, this is a little video that I'm going to show that talks about the um, responsibility for climate change. You probably know where this is going. Um, we think of uh, climate change, like, like we, can, we explain it sometimes as a bathtub model. You're putting CO2 in the atmosphere, and at some point that bathtub might start to overflow. And that's, uh, that's called the, so the carbon budget when it starts to overflow. So this is who has contributed to that bathtub, the water in the bathtub. And what you can see is over time, the United States has been the dominant contributor to, uh, to, to this effect. Um, Deforestation has had a huge impact. What some of these countries are on here because um, of deforestation. Um, and although China is now the largest annual emitter, uh, the United States has a huge historical responsibility. Over here, this is something I want to talk about called the carbon budget. This is how much space you have in the bathtub before the water starts to overflow. Um, this is the remaining carbon budget before we hit 1.5 degrees. 1.5 degrees is the safe limit estimated in the IPCC. Some scientists think that safe limit was passed a long time ago. But um, as you saw from that video, 
we're getting awfully close to hitting the 1.5 degrees. And one of the reasons I'm here today is because 2023, uh, some scientists are starting to think that we have already hit that 1.5 degrees ahead of time. Okay, what is the IPC synthesis report? The IPCC stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's a scientific group of people, similar to like the decadal, the decadal review or the P5, a bunch of scientists get together, write a document. It's assembled by the United Nations, and the goal is to assess the evidence, the science, and the impacts of climate change. It was created in 1988, so we've been working on this for some time now. Uh, it uh, has 195 members, so it is a truly international endeavor. It does not conduct research. It reviews all the existing uh, literature and sort of summarizes our current understanding in a way that tries to be accessible, although the report is very difficult to read. Uh, so they fail on that front. It is the internationally accepted authority on climate change, and it informs the government about current knowledge. So this is why, for scientists, I think this is a really good starting point to go and read these figures. Um, so here are the different assessment reports. These are the different reports that were produced. They take a long time to actually produce. And when they come out, they're already a little bit out of date. So uh, these are the different reports. Now, I want to highlight the fact that in 2007, uh, the reports already said that warming of the climate is unequivocal. Okay, that's a really strong word, right? I've never used the word unequivocal in my papers. I've never said... I have detected dark energy unequivocally. Uh, we always, use, always never, never use these words. And then 2022, we have underestimated the risk and current efforts are not enough. If we continue the path, we're getting to three degrees warming. It's awfully close to the dinosaurs, okay? So those are the message. Now, I would like everyone to be knowledgeable of this document, but it's also important to know the limitations of the document. So remember that, that this is a, um, a large group of people interacting with politicians and various influences trying to water things down. It, it was There was a report that was leaked, the version that the scientists proposed, and then the version that came out showing that it had indeed been watered down. So the IPCC has been criticized for being too conservative and politically influenced using models that are too simplistic, ignoring important effects, and assuming technology that we can't deploy to scale, okay? But despite these facts, okay, we still have these pretty stark warnings. So the Earth is a highly complex nonlinear system. We know this in astrophysics. We work with highly nonlinear complex systems. Many of you work on hydrosims. Uh, you understand the difficulty of modeling such systems. And so part of the problem that we face is that there's a lot of assumptions that go into this and the uncertainties are large, okay? We don't really understand the dynamics of the Earth system. And uh, it's super important to understand that the models are simplistic and the predictions have probably been underestimated. Okay, so the IPCC has three different working groups that each produce their own report. Working group one is the science of climate change. You know, what is climate change and how is it happening? And this report um, basically says it's already underway, it's human caused, et cetera, et cetera. Working group two is about adaptation. Um, this is about uh, how, how can we adapt to the effects that are already happening? You know, we're going to, we're not gonna be able to avoid this problem and we have to start adapting in parallel to trying to stop the effect. And that's called adaptation in the words of climate science. The third report is about mitigation. Mitigation in, the, in, in climate science means stopping, like stopping the problem, to stop putting carbon into the atmosphere. Um, and so to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, we need deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, um, this may be already out of date because 2024 may confirm that we may have already passed this boundary ahead of time. So uh, these three working groups produce their own reports plus some special reports on the oceans. And these are combined into the synthesis report, which is 85 pages. So it's a starting point, um, and, but it's important to keep the limitations that I mentioned in mind. Okay, so I have my undergrads in a G class read this document. So if they can do it, you can too. It's not an easy read. Uh, the one thing they failed at terribly is making it readable. It's very hard to read. but um, as scientists, you you can you can do it. And so I um, 
have been doing these guided readings at IPC, you can sign up on my website for the next version, uh, probably like a month from now. One of the difficulties in reading this document is the vocabulary and the acronyms. Uh, there's a lot of vocabulary. So for my class, I created a, um, a simplified glossary that you can read. Even just reading this is really helpful to define all the different words that, that are used in all the different acronyms. Okay, so this is also listed from my website. So a, a little bit of vocabulary that is useful to understand for the, for the rest of the talk and to understand the IPC report. Cumulative CO2 emissions is, is how much water we have in the bathtub, how much CO2 we have already put into the atmosphere. The remaining carbon budget is um, how much space we have in the bathtub before it overflows for a given goal. So there's a different carbon budget for 1.5 degrees and a different carbon budget for two degrees. Committed change is the fact that some of the emissions underway are irreversible for thousands of years. And that's because, for example, a lot of the CO2 has been absorbed by the ocean. And the ocean uh, has a slow uh, time to respond. And so the ocean is responding to the CO2 that it has already absorbed and the heat. It's, that's going to take thousands of years to, uh, to respond. The other word that comes up a lot is shared socioeconomic pathways. We're going to look at lots of plots that have SSPs. These are various scenarios for the future, depending, assuming how's the world going to develop. Are we going to use lots of fossil fuels? Are we going to transition to green energy? So these are models, okay, models assuming some economic development. And then there's a lot of vocabulary in the IPCC report related to removing carbon from the atmosphere. So there's lots of different ways of doing this, but there's lots of different words that basically mean the same thing. We need to take carbon out. So carbon, deliberate carbon removal, direct air capture, carbon dioxide storage, storage and capture, carbon dioxide removal. Okay, lots of different words that basically sort of mean the same thing from our perspective. And that's because we've reached the point where we realize that the problem has become important enough that this is going to be necessary. Um, so the shared socioeconomic pathways are important to understand because these are the model predictions, right? Everyone wants to know what's going to happen 20, 30 years from now. It's going to happen 10 years from now. So uh, these are the different SSPs. And uh, these are different models. This SSP1 is OK. This SSP5 is very, very bad. OK. And these are the different uh, predicted warming temperatures. Um, this is time, and this is carbon dioxide uh, per year. So uh, annual carbon emissions, this is important to know, this is a number you should have fixed into your head, is about 50 gigatons per year. It'd be more like 55 or 60 now. Um, uh, probably 55 here. So depending on if we continue at the current rate of putting carbon in the air, or if we start to go down, these correspond to these different SSPs. Okay, so the good scenario would be we stop burning fossil fuels and we decrease, and the worst scenario would be we increase our emissions out here. The goals of the Paris Accord are to keep us below 1.5 degrees, two degrees maximum. You can see that that goal corresponds to SSP1 and SSP2, or SSP, they're kind of confusing. Anyway, this, this range here, 1.5 degrees, two degrees. So, there's a number of problems with these SSPs. Um, one is the unrealistic range. So we don't think we're going to take this road here because we already know that we're starting to deploy renewable energy. They're getting cheaper. Already carbon emissions are starting to plateau. So you know the, the, these ranges are just unrealistic given what we know now. The two lowest are the safe range. This is where we want to be. So if you want to explore, for example, the galaxy formation of dwarfs, you don't want a simulation, you don't want to run your simulation for clusters, right? You want to run your simulation for dwarfs. So the same thing, if you want to explore this range, shouldn't we also have some down here? Like we want to explore this range and not just have it be at the edge of what we're exploring. So that's one problem. And this gives a false sense of optimism. So when the latest report came out, there were elements of the media that portrayed this as this is great news because we've avoided the red lines. Like we know the red lines are not gonna happen. And so there, there was quite a bit of optimism in the media. Um, but so the analogy I'd like to give for an astrophysicist would be to say, okay, we've done a good job in the solar system. We have identified all the Mars-sized planets. Okay, we know that a Mars-sized planet hitting the earth probably created the moon, the, the object called Thea. 
So now that we've identified all the Marses in the solar system, we don't have to worry about mapping smaller objects. God, our job is done, okay? And then we're ignoring all the 10 sized asteroid, 10 kilometer asteroids that cause the extinction of the dinosaurs. Okay, that's kind of the analogy that I like to give here. Another problem with these um, SSPs is that some of the safe pathways, those SSP ones and twos, basically employ a magic wand to remove carbon from the atmosphere. This is highlighted in this paper by James Hansen. It's called Young People's Burden, Requirement of Negative CO2 Emissions. What is a negative CO2 emission? It means that we're not putting carbon in the air, we're taking carbon out. And so if you look at some of these curves down here, these are the annual CO2 emissions per year. Not only we have gone to net zero, but we are also removing carbon from the air, okay? We don't actually know how to do that today. We don't even really know how to bend the curve, let alone take carbon out. So this is a problem. And you know, why, why, what, why might we introduce this to make this look better, right? Um, Okay, key findings of the IPCC report. So much of the graphs that you're gonna look at are CO2 and temperature versus time. And here I mentioned earlier, they're correlated. So you can see they're indeed correlated when CO2 concentration varies, temperature varies. And then time over here is not a linear axis. So this is millions of years, thousands of years. And uh, this is sort of modern time over here. Um, this is, these are measurements, uh, and these are the models looking into the future. These models are based on these different assumptions and the different climate models, which have you know a range of uncertainties. So what do we know? Atmospheric CO2 and temperature have varied in the past. In recent history, so over the, the last um, ice ages, the range of CO2 in the atmosphere was about 180 and 300 parts per million. So there was a scientific, there's a scientific organization called 350.org advocating for not going beyond 350 because that was the upper range that we had known during these interglacial periods. But today we are at 420 ppm, so we've already exceeded that limit. And if you look at this graph here and kind of think like, how far in the past are we pushing back to? The IPCC report says twice the amount ever seen in the past 800,000 years. New research from uh, UCSC suggests it may actually be higher. It may be in, in the past several millions of years. So much higher already than during the interglacial periods, which is concerning given what I told you that, uh, you know, this is the level over which mo the, so the, state, the modern humans have evolved over these very stable conditions. This is the highest previous limit that I mentioned, 350. These are the variations during, uh, you know, the last um, interglacial periods. And 2022, we were up here, we're basically at 420. This is a graph from the IPCC that I think is very important. So I'm gonna kind of explain some more detail. Um, this is called the emissions gap. So again, we're seeing here the same kind of graph, time versus greenhouse gas emissions, annual emissions per year. So at about 50 gigaton uh, per year. And, uh, these are the data points of sort of where we are right now. It's a little out of date because the IPCC reports are a little bit out of date. Um, these are where we think we're going given implemented policies. So since the Paris Accord, countries are supposed to say how much they're gonna cut their emissions and they have a goal. They, they say, okay, I'm gonna cut my emissions by this much. Then they come back a few years later and say, okay, how much have you actually cut your emissions? And it never, meets what they said they were going to do. Um, and so this is the measured trend from implemented policy. So you can see that we're starting to turn over. We're not going like that. We're starting to turn over, but we're also not going like that. Um, and so this is the, the gap between where we're going from implemented policies and where we need to go to be on this path for 1.5 degrees. 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, okay? The data are not going down. Um, and this is the, the, the gap between our ambitions, what we say we want to do, and what we actually do. Now, there are different pathways. Wait, wait, it, hitting 1.5 degrees at this stage is unavoidable. It's going to happen in the next few years. Um, two degrees, uh, we either need to go down here, or we continue on this trend, and then we have deep, deep, deep cuts around 2030. 
this is the emergency. It's, it, this is the now. This is not that it's your kid's problem. It's the next, you know, the next five years. <laughs> this is the now problem. Um, and uh, so these are the different pathways to two degrees. And so this is a figure I encourage everyone to look at and think about is in the IPC synthesis, synthesis report. So what the synthesis report says is we need deep and rapid greenhouse ga gas emissions. We need to reach net zero, including also methane. Now, this is the one I want you to read when we go back to that question of the IPC being conservative and uncertainties. Uh, the report said the best estimate of reaching 1.5 degrees lies in the first half of 2030s. We may we have already breached 1.5 degrees this year. The question is whether we have breached it on average because the temperature goes up and down. You know, we had we have an El Nino this year. Maybe that has caused a, a heating. But the question is whether we have breached it on average. So we will know by 2024, and we may have breached this 1.5 degrees early. Why? Because the models are very simple. There's a lot that's not taken into account. I'm going to talk about feedback effects. Um, and you know, would you want your future and your children's future to be contingent on hydro simulations modeling star formation? You know, would you bet all your inheritance on? your star formation recipe being correct. This is what we're asking of the climate scientists, right? It's a tall order. Um, and then global warming of two degrees sometime this century. Now, the pathways, those SSPs, even though they're uncertain, say that with the continuation of the policies we have now, will lead to a global warming of three degrees by 2100. That's, that's, that's getting back to the dinosaurs. However, the uncertainties are really important to keep in mind. So if you read the footnotes, these are often unfortunately buried in the footnotes of the IPCC. This basically says that four degrees warming could occur if climate sensitivity is underestimated, right? There are uncertainties in the models. Maybe we've forgotten a bunch of things and it's not impossible that we could have a much stronger increase in temperature. The remaining carbon budget is an important concept because it's sort of, it's that bathtub model. It helps you think about how much space we have to maneuver. Um, now this is, at, this, is, this is now a little bit out of date, even though these slides are like a year old, <laughs> because uh, the best estimate of the remaining carbon budget for 1.5 degrees was about 500 gigatons. This is from the report. And so this is simple math. If we're burning 50 gigatons per year and you multiply that too, you get 500 gigatons. That's why the estimate was 2030 for hitting this, this limit. Uh, why, why might we hit that early? Because we don't totally understand the correlation between temperature and CO2. We could hit that early if there were like feedbacks of that coming into play. The problem is once we exhaust up this, this, um, this carbon budget, we've already used up a good part of the budget for two degrees. So you, then you really need to very deep cuts to, you, you don't have a whole lot of margin to not hit two degrees as well. Now, this is the kind of stuff to pay attention to. Um, in scenarios where we have increasing CO2 emissions, Additional ecosystem responses not included in the models, turbulent MHD, hard to put into your models, right? No one likes to put that into the model. Um, um, the effect of wetlands, the permafrost, the wildfires, how does that all interact? And that could change the climate models. So these model predictions are uncertain and they're debated. Um, this paper over here, Hansen 2023, which was very debated, it was just, um, uh, just published, um, uses something that's more like an empirical model, so not a physical hydro sim, but an empirical model, like a sim. Uh, looking at past data suggests that even if we cut emissions today, the temperature equilibrium in the future could be as high as 10 degrees. Okay, this is kind of the level of uncertainty that we're talking about. And so this comes back to my statement of, you know, how much would you bet your future on your simulations? So in this case, what's the best solution? The best solution is to be conservative and stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere. We, we, we have unfortunately already missed the, the chance to be conservative. So some other predictions from the IPCC reports, extreme weather, we all know this, we've been experiencing it, we've seen it in the news. 
Uh, severe climate events are going to become more common. A 100-year flood may happen every 10 years. Go look up the flood of 1861. I discovered this preparing my lectures for this class, and I don't understand why no one knows about this. I know, we never taught this in school. The California flood of 1861. It, it, go look it up. I'll leave the surprise for you. Um, Pakistan, 33 million people displaced because of these biblical floods. California 2020. You know, we, we've, all, we've all witnessed this. We know it's happening. So also tipping points. The, so what are tipping points? A tipping point is a point, uh, you know, you push the egg off this and it cracks and you can't put it back together. That's a tipping point, point of no return. There are tipping points in the Earth system, which are one of the big uncertainties of the climate models. So uh, this particular, this paper, 2022, talks about 16 different kinds of tipping points. Many of these are not included in the models. So I, I'm not familiar with all of these. I'm just going to step through a few, a few to give you a sense of what we're talking about. Um, the melting of the ice sheets is a very important tipping point. And because we don't understand this very well, that's one of the reasons we don't understand sea level rise very well. So that's a tipping point. Um, dis the disruption of the Earth's currents is a tipping point for reasons that I could go into more detail if you want. Um, this circulation here, the Atlantic Mediterranean Overturning Circulation called AMOC, uh, helps regulate the entire climate of Europe and North America. There's possibility that these uh, currents could be disrupted, fundamentally changing uh, the climates in these regions. And again, in the IPCC report, the current models are biased towards this uh, circulation being overly stable. They don't really, you know, they're probably um, too conservative on their assumptions. The Amazon rainforest is another critical uh, tipping point. Once you lose the rainforest, it doesn't come back. And what I mean by that statement is that, you know, it may not come back for millions of years. Uh, so the thing that we're talking about, the Earth, the Earth could return to the state millions of years from now, but it's not going to return to the state within 100 years. You know, you can't just recreate the Amazon rainforest. Similarly, the loss of the um, tropical coral reefs is another thing that could be lost for all purposes forever. And that's a tipping point. You can't just recreate the coral reefs. This is another important figure that uh, is important to digest. These are the predictions for the tipping points given current climate models. So these are the different tipping points. These are the melting of the ice sheets, the loss of the coral reef, um, loss of the Amazon. And uh, these are uh, where the Paris Accord wants us to be. Okay, that's the 1.5 and the two degrees over here. So I like the fact it was correlated with this graph over here of time versus CO2. And then this is similar to the other plot in that it's looking at where we're going given current policies. So these are the policies that we say we want to do, and this is where we actually are. And so if you look at this range, this error bar is sort of the range of uncertainty for these tipping points. What you see is that where we are now, we may already have past some of these tipping points. And some of the early tipping points that we're going to pass, for example, are the loss of the coral reefs predicted around 2050, unless things are accelerating. So we may already be losing some of these tipping points. But to me, there may be more tipping points. Again, a complex system. You know, This paper talks about um, 41 tipping points. And the thing that I also am very concerned about, which isn't really taken into account into any of this, are potential geopolitical tipping points. Um, the cryosphere, these are the frozen components of Earth's system, are expected to melt. So we have uh, two big sort of ice components, the Arctic and Antarctica, and Greenland over here. Uh, they have very different geographies because the Arctic is um, ice uh, with sea underneath surrounded by land, and Antarctica is ice with land underneath surrounded by sea. So they behave very differently for those reasons. If this Greenland ice, shell, uh, ice sheet melts, it could contribute up to seven meters of sea level rise. This one over here, the West Antarctic ice sheet, is the one that we think would melt first, and that could contribute three meters of sea level rise. Over here, this East Antarctic ice sheet, we think is more stable and would last for a longer time. The Greenland ice sheet. So Greenland is covered in a thick layer of ice. 
The reason for that is because this ice sheet formed over millions of years. Every winter, it's, there was snow and it didn't melt. And so it just accumulated. Okay, so that, it took that long to form this huge ice pack of fresh water. If it starts to melt, there's a tipping point where there's a point where if it starts melting too much, it kind of accelerates. There's a feedback effect. Um, and that could lead to seven meters of ocean rise. Now, this, this, the time scale of this is very uncertain, which is why if you ask people how fast is sea level going to rise, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. So uh, sea level rise from two effects. One is just added water from the melting ice sheets. This is the one that has the large uncertainty because we don't know how much water is going to melt as a function of time. The second one is a thermal expansion of the seawater due to increased temperatures. That's physics that we understand. So today, uh, sea levels have rise by about 20 centimeters. This is what Miami would look like under two degrees warming, okay, 0.5 to one meters. Right? They're, they're, they're important parts of the US coastland and other places, Bangladesh, uh, the Philippines, um, uh, that, that, that would uh, encounter very ser serious effects. This is what I said earlier about the uncertainty. The large uncertainty across the different methods is because of the deep uncertainty of the melting of the ice sheets. Now, in this other paper, I'm trying to give you different viewpoints. I'm not a specialist myself, so I'm not qualified to weigh in on the debate, but I'll give you the range of debates. So this paper by James, James Hansen, uh, former director of Goddard, a uh, very famous climate scientist. He testified to Congress on the climate crisis uh, in the 80s or something. Um, in this paper that I mentioned earlier, he suggests that using paleoclimate climate data, so data from the past, that at 450 ppm where we are today, in the past, the Earth may have been ice free, suggesting that in the past, these ice sheets may have already melted the at this current level of concentration. The question then is, you know, how long? Are we talking decades or millennia? Um, food security is something that I am extremely concerned about. Climate change will increasingly affect food security. And uh, this is a graph that is extremely concerning. You know, the world has actually made a good, decent amount of progress on uh, undernourishment and, and water and the sustainability goals. We were making good progress until here. And then recently, this is the undernourishment in the world. This curve has been going start to go up again. We are starting to lose the gains that we made over the last few decades. Um, the crops are projected to start to suffer due to lack of water, heat, and also uncertainty. It's hard for farmers to plant and know what to plant when they don't know the, what weather to expect. So the risks of the food system are growing. Um, and we've already experienced here, even in privileged America, the inflation and food prices and, you know, so, uh, but this is going to really impact the livelihood of the poor and vulnerable communities. You know, we, we can still afford the extra food prices here, some of us, but, uh, you know, there are populations that are incredibly at risk. Um, and this is the risk of food insecurity will be a stress multiplier for migration, which is my next topic. So migration, from my perspective, I think is possibly one of the greatest challenges that we face in the next few decades to, to 2100. Uh, this is a paper from 2020 uh, that talks about where humans are comfortable living. Like we don't like living in Antarctica, it's not comfortable for us. And we don't like living in deserts where it's too hot. It's just physically at some point, it's too hot for us to survive. Um, and so this is called the human climate niche, uh, mapping out where humans like to live. And, um, here, the basis of the, the paper is trying to say, okay, we've mapped out where humans like to live. Now let's look to the future with changing conditions. Where are people going to have to move away from? And at 2.7 degrees warming, and remember, the IPCC thinks if we don't change policies, we're going to hit three degrees warming by 2100. The prediction is that more than a billion people may be forced to migrate. And these are the regions from which they're going to migrate. I'm just going to pause and let you assimilate that number, right? A billion people migrating because they can't live there anymore. There's no food, there's no water. So that is stark. That is a stark prediction. 
And then that has to make you think about geopolitical tipping points. And you know, in the US, there is already a strong debate about immigration. Uh, and we're nowhere close to the levels that are predicted to happen. So the reason I'm here today kind of sounding these alarm bells is because 2023 was off the charts and not in a good way. So this is the sea surface temperature anomaly measured in 2023 compared to past data, right? How many sigma is that, right? It's not like your one sigma astronomy detection. That's pretty stark. Um, how much forest burnt in Canada this year compared to past measurements? This is the uh, the size of the Antarctic sea ice sheet. Remember I said we don't totally understand the melting of that ice sheet. And another sea surface temperature measurement in 2023. And 2023 has been declared the hottest year on record uh, for like July, August, and September. Okay, so these graphs, when you look at them from my perspective, it makes me think that we may be witnessing already fundamental changes in the balance of that Earth system. Tipping points may be underway. We saw that given the current policies and the uncertainties, we may already be seeing these tipping points. And more broadly speaking, we need to recognize our planetary limits. As an astronomer with a cosmic perspective, this is a message that we can be talking about. And when I look at this, it just really makes me think that we are in an emergency, like a COVID crisis, only about 10 times worse, maybe more. But this is a crisis. This is not a problem that we can wait until tomorrow to talk about. So. This is the climate crisis, but there are other problems that we face that are almost equally as important. This is the biodiversity crisis. So in the Earth's history, the big five are the big five uh, global mass extinctions. There was one down here at 2.5 giga years related to our atmosphere becoming oxidized. Note, change in the Earth's atmosphere, great you know, extinction. This was a bunch of bacteria, so maybe people don't care so much about this one. It isn't counted as the big five. The big five here, so 440 million years ago, 300 million years ago, the end of the Permian, I'm gonna talk about this one. This is the great dying because 95% of species went extinct and it took 30 million years to recover. So yes, the earth system does recover, life's come back, new life forms. We're talking about kind of million of year time scales. The KT boundary, this was the one that probably happened the fastest due to the asteroid impact. All of these other ones in, are all related to changes in the Earth's atmosphere. This one, the third extinction, the Permian Triassic about 200 million years ago, is called the Great Dying because 95% of species went extinct. In this case, CO2 levels may have been as high as 1,000 ppm. Now we're talking about 420, okay? So Earth has gone through these phases before. This is not new. The reason uh, there was such a great dying was because lethal global warming and acidification of the ocean, leading to huge losses in marine life. Although today's levels are not as high, I point you to this paper talking about the fact that the rate of change that we are undergoing today, the rate at which we are changing the atmosphere, is about 14 times higher than estimated during the Permian. The Permian was probably related to a bunch of volcanoes going off, but that's a you know, relatively slow process. In a slow process, species can adapt. They can move north, they might have some mutations, they might change to adapt. On 100 year time scales, it's very hard to adapt. And so this is why the rate is important for the biodiversity question. Um, during the Permian, we had a greenhouse climate. The poles were ice free. Forest extended to the poles, crocodiles lived here. These equatorial regions were probably deserts and probably you know, un uninhabited. Uh, the temperature was plus maybe five, maybe 10 degrees. It's kind of uncertain. Sea levels were probably 50 to 100 meters higher when we had an ice-free planet. So the sixth extinction, unfortunately, is already underway. Uh, and uh, we are seeing, and I'll show you some graphs, um, uh, a sixth extinction or an attrition underway. And the impact of humans on the Earth has been so large that geologists are now defining a new geological age called the Anthropocene. So we are leaving the Holocene and entering the Anthropocene. The exact date of that transition, I think, is still being debated. But sometime within the last hundred years, there will be a new geological time frame that has been defined. 
And this is not really a proud moment for humanity. The reason we're defining this Anthropocene is because we've had unprecedented effects on um, you know, uh, microplastics, uh, nuclear waste that we can see in the geological record, uh, you know, loss of species. <laughs> this is not a particularly proud thing to, to be to be proud of. This is the lake that will be used in Canada as a marker of the of, of the Anthropocene. So why is the sixth extinction underway? Rapid global warming, ocean acidification, loss of habitat because we've converted most wild spaces to food production, spread of pathogens and invasive species due to globalization hunting and overfishing. When I started researching this topic, I was astounded. I had never heard these numbers before. The biomass of domestic chickens is three times higher than wild birds. That really hits home the degree to which we have encroached on the wildlife population and this unprecedented rate of change. There are many stark graphs like this. I chose one for mammals, but there's many that look like this. Uh, this is Earth's mammals by total biomass. Humans, our biomass dominates the total biomass of Earth for mammals and the stuff that feeds humans, okay? That's what the Earth's biomass is today. It's different if you look at, uh, you know, other things, but when you look at bi mammals, uh, this is what it looks like. And globally speaking, in a lot of metrics, you can see the dominance of humans. Okay, here are whales pushed off onto the side here and elephants over here, this tiny little spot here. Um, species across the world are going extinct. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in this because it's hard to go out and map every single amphibian or insect. So we just don't have the power to actually measure these true trends. But from what we can measure, we see that across the animal species, birds, mammals, insects, uh, this is the extinction rate. This is There's always a background extinction rate, but we are clearly increasing over here. And this increase in the extension rate is mirrored by the exponential growth of the human population. So in the last you know, few centuries, we have seen exponential growth in the human population, which is just not leaving enough room for other living animals, largely related to the fact that farming got better. So an example of um, the biodiversity problem and this extinction problem, Coral reefs are probably going to be lost sometime in the next few decades. Uh, they have the highest biodiversity of any ecosystem, maybe even more than a rainforest. We haven't really fully quantified the biodiversity of coral reefs. And uh, when we do, we find that they may have more species than a rainforest. This is an amazing number, but they take up only 1% of the ocean floor, but they're home to about 25% of marine life. So if you lose the coral reefs, you lose that marine life. And also they're an important habitat for fish nurseries. Fish go there to spawn, to have their babies. So even the fish that leave in the deep oceans may be lost if they don't have a safe place to uh, have their babies. Um, and they also provide food for a large number of people. Coral reefs will be lost due to acidification and temperature change. So the rising, they're very sensitive to temperature, but also acidification, there's a point where if the oceans become too acid, they just kind of dissolve. And uh, we think they might start to dissolve at 560, remember about 460, which could happen mid-century depending on the next few decades. The second example are insects. Insects are declining at an unprecedented rate. Uh, due to defrostation, light pollution, climate change, insects are a critical part of the food chain. The birds eat the insects, you know, everything eats the insects, so it's part of the food chain. And they also serve as a pollinator for the world's crops. And this is a really nice infographic that I have my students look at. It's really well done. The decline on such a short time scale is really unprecedented. I really highly recommend this film. Who's watched this one, Life on Planet Earth? Isn't it great? I mean, great, but not great. <laughs> but it's really well done because the message Dave, um, Sir David Attenborough has is that over the course of his lifetime, since he started his job and today, he has witnessed this destruction and this disappearance of the animals that he was um, documenting. And uh, you know that's sort of part of the problem. We, we have really short lifetimes and we're not necessarily aware of the decline unless uh, we are very looking for it specifically or, or where we look at the graphs and we see. Like, for example, I don't think many of you wake up in the morning and look at the sky and think, like, where are all the passenger pigeons, right? You just, they're gone. Like, 
That's how it is. That's normal. That's the new normal. So because the new normal is shifting, we, we, it's hard for us to appreciate the loss of biodiversity. But this is a real testimony from David Sir Attenborough. Um, so this is the last talked about biodiversity crisis. We really need to be talking about a dual crisis of climate and biodiversity. And more generally speaking, this is the message that as astronomers we can convey. The climate crisis is really just a symptom of human impacts on the finite planet. Whether that's overfishing or, or changes in the CO2 or taking over all the land, it's really just one symptom of a broader problem, which is the fact that we have a finite planet, we're not going to Mars, and we have reached the limit of, uh, of being able to live sustainably on that planet. That's called overshoot. So right now we're using up about one, like two Earth resources, and we only have one Earth. Um, this is some nice work from a center in Stockholm that thinks about this more cosmic perspective and thinks about planetary boundaries, like planetary boundaries that we can't just go beyond because we only have a finite planet, and sort of claiming that we're already beyond six of these planetary limits. Um, I am nearing the end here, so I have just a little bit more to go. Uh, proposed solutions, there's no single proposed solution. And that's because this affects all sectors of the economy. What is needed is a myriad of solutions, lots and lots of little things that all add up. But when we talk about solutions, everything has to come back to stop burning fossil fuels. If it's not something that's stopping putting carbon in the air, it's not as critical. Okay, that we, we can't let the bathtub overflow. I'm not going to talk about solutions because you already know them, the solar panels, the green energy, and all the different stuff. There's a really nice list here, which you can go and explore to look at all the different myriad of solutions that are being proposed, preserving the forests, preserving peatlands. I'm going to talk about the more controversial ones because you're going to start hearing a lot about them. This is the carbon capture question. So in the latest IPCC report, the, they basically had to say that we need to start drawing carbon out of the atmosphere. It's going to be necessary. Um, these are called the negative emissions. Uh, and also, we know that there's certain sectors of the economy, like agriculture or long distance trucking, that's going to be hard to get to net zero. So we're going to have to take carbon out to compensate for these things that we don't have other technological solutions for. Um, and so this is now talked about in the, in the IPCC reports. The problem being that we actually can't deploy this technology at scale. We have small things for carbon capture, but nothing at scale. And so there are articles that you can go and read about the debate surrounding carbon capture. Um, another thing that we're going to hear a lot more about is geoengineering. Geoengineering is the deliberate attempt to change Earth's climate. Now, we are already geoengineering because putting CO2 in the atmosphere is changing the Earth's climate. So we are already doing it. But the question is, are we going to do something deliberate to try to limit the effects? There are different proposals. One over here, which is probably the most talked about, is basically polluting the atmosphere. Bunch, uh, throwing a bunch of sulfur into the atmosphere. Uh, this is what you would get if you had um, um, just pollution in the atmosphere, like LA had decades ago. And uh, this, these sulfur particles uh, reflect sunlight. And so they keep some of the sunlight from coming in. And they there, thereby don't heat the Earth as much. OK, this, this is now getting funded. This is highly debated because you know the Union of Concerned Scientists would say we can't deploy technology to without addressing the root of the problem. We got to first cut the emissions rather than trying to just keep the sun away. It does nothing to address ocean acidification, right? If you're still putting CO2 in the air, you're still acidifying the ocean, and it's dangerous. We only have one planet to tinker with. Who's going to get to decide how it's done and when? Um, a less intense sun could affect crops, it could spark wars because maybe these guys want it, maybe Canada doesn't want it, but India really wants it. Um, on the other hand, we're already changing the climate and maybe there's a point where we, we decide we need it anyway. This is the debate around geoengineering. Okay, moving forward, I have two more slides to share with you, maybe three. I think it's critical that we recognize and discuss this existential threat in all fields of academia, in all, in, in all fields of life. 
Um, I've linked all these papers from my website, so uh, you could go and look at them. This is a really simple, easy, short one to read. It's a state of the climate report by scientists. So this is not a big, large organization. This is a bunch of climate scientists who wrote their state of the report. Um, you know, what do they say in this report? This is coming from the scientists. We are afraid of the territory that we have entered. We're shocked by the extreme weather. Uh, we need to tell the truth to the public and to ourselves about the dangers that we face. Um, and we warn of potential collapse of natural and socioeconomic systems. We have exceeded the safe boundaries and we need to declare this as an emergency. This is a paper that I think every department should read as a journal club. Um, it's called No Research on a Dead Planet. I've linked it again from my website. Um, I'll let you read some of the things on the right here. Um, but, uh, you know, the basic message here is that you as astronomers, astrophysicists or physicists, you really exist in this profession because you get money from the taxpayer who pays our salaries. And that can happen in a society that is thriving, where there's excess money to be spent on our salaries. Um, but let's not take that for granted. You know, in a world facing a climate crisis, a migration crisis, weather crisis, it's not clear to me personally that astrophysics is going to continue to survive. I think the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis are fundamental existential threats to academia itself. OK, so if that's something we're not talking about, we need to be talking about a potential threat to the existence of academia and the existence of science. OK, we may not get to do science in the future. We may be working on fundamental problems like feeding people. So all academics, no matter their di discipline, have a role in this to educate, to talk about it, to think about solutions, and to think about the impacts on our field and talk about it with our um, early career scientists. And I personally have started to think really a lot about our role in metric for success as an astrophysicist. You know, facing an unprecedented humanitarian biodiversity crisis, what does it mean to be an astrophysicist? And what does it mean to be a scientist? In this context, what is our metric for success? You know. Is it n papers plus one? What does it mean to be successful if there's no more food D? <clears throat> um, what does it mean to be successful if people along the equator, you know, can't live anymore? And in the context of my work, like dark energy figure of merit, is that my metric for success? Or finding another planet? So this is something we need to work on in the same way that we've all collaborated and worked together, for example, on the diversity question. That's something that we have all come together as a community. So what can you do personally? There's no short, easy list. I don't have like a thing that you go do this thing and it's going to get better. But what I do know is that simulation needs pretty fundamental and urgent changes. And so the things that we can do are learn about the problem, read the IPCC report. I've listed a bunch of things on my website. Think about it, teach it. I have a class where I teach this, raise awareness. That's why I'm here today talking about something that's not my field of expertise. And I would say everyone needs to do something, OK? It's all a drop in the bucket, but we need many drops in the bucket. Everyone needs to be putting drops in the bucket. So pick something that you are interested in and do that, OK? Pick one thing that you're passionate about that is related to the climate crisis and do that. That would be great. <laughs> we can think as a community about the roles and responsibility of the scientists and astronomers. Science is not a thing that occurs in a vacuum, right? You get a salary from somewhere. You only exist because of this excess salary. And science has a role in the current problem because science has enabled technology. Technology, for example, created the Haber process, which extracts nitrogen from the atmosphere. This alone has led to uh, an extra 4 billion people on the planet. So scientific progress is correlated with the problem. We need to be aware of that. Science is also part of the solution. We also need to talk about that. And as astronomers, we can talk about the fact that we have reached our planetary limits and we're not going to Mars or to any favorite exoplanet. Read the synthesis report, know about its limitations. You can sign up for the guided readings on my website. Here's where I listed a bunch of stuff. I tried to cherry pick it to be sort of the most accessible and straight, straight to the heart of the matter. And learn what Carnegie is working on. Talk to Dan Kelson, who sent a message about Carnegie is doing stuff. Ask your colleagues, what is Carnegie doing? Push Carnegie to change. At UCSC, we have a student group and a faculty group pushing for change. 
Uh, maybe Carnegie needs the early career scientists to be out there telling the old folks like myself that we need to change. So this is my uh, final slide. I'm going to leave you with some wise words from our guiding leaders from Astro 2020. Astronomical activities do not occur in a vacuum. We don't just work here doing our science independently from everything else. We live on an Earth that has a finite, uh, a finite, a finite regime. And uh, the future astronomy, like the world to which it is bound, will depend on the development and implementation of more sustainable practices. And I'm going to leave you with this other quote from um, Greta Thun Thunberg, uh, incredibly famous climate activist, very inspiring personality. And I think this is really the key message. I think we do need to panic. We are at a stage where we need to panic. But the thing that I don't want you to do, this would be a total failure of my talk, would be to walk away and do nothing. Okay. Not doing anything is the worst outcome. We all need to work away and put some drops in the bucket and do something. So yes, we need to panic. This is a difficult situation, but we also need to act and we all need to work on this problem. So I will leave you there. Thank you for bearing with me. I know this was a long talk. Thank you so much for coming today. Thanks a lot for this talk. This was really, really amazing. Um, when you show that that pie chart, uh -huh. like the different sectors contributing, this the economic like, sectors. Yeah, 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 sectors, yeah. And it says like energy and transportation. Uh huh. Inside the other sectors, is the like transportation and energy consumption of those sectors included there? I'm mean, <laughs> think of like. Yeah, I double mean, counting or something. Well, or whether like you, you can like, you know, whether energy and transportation are larger than that, and you can address this by like going to less, you know, pro less places. Like when it says industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like how much is moving goods or how much, is, you know. Energy. Some of this, I, I, the answer is I don't think so, but there's many different forms of this figure because, you know, how you break it all down. There's lot, so there's many different, I just picked one. There's lots of different ways to break it down, but industry is also related to things like making cement. Making cement is actually a pretty big part of the problem. And when you turn limestone into cement, inescapably you lose CO, CO2 and also steel. So I, my hunch, again, like I'm not an expert, so is that a lot of this is cement and steel. But there's many different versions of this. The real key point is that it's really everything. Yeah. Yeah, when I learned about it, I, you know, I was, oh, stop driving and flying. It's just, yes, but not enough. Yeah. So the 50 uh, gigatons yeah. per year, yeah. is that just from human activities? Or does that include natural processes like uh, volcanic eruptions? I think that's just from human activities. Okay, yeah. so like a particularly bad year in which, you know, a major volcanic eruption takes place might yes. kind of push up off balance even quicker. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for turning to the future. Uh, I was wondering whether there is some uh, discussion presently about limiting childbirth, the effects of this on uh, the crisis that the crisis you're talking about? I think it's a really great question that is politically not correct to talk about in most circles, but I think it's something that we definitely need to think about more. Is there a lot of research about this? Like, I just, I'm, a, I'm, I'm on all these, um, I'm on all these email lists and I just saw something yesterday, which I haven't digested, but it, it was related to people who were thinking about that and trying to communicate about that. But I would say it's still a minority of what people talk about, but I think it has to be part of the conversation um, because the exponential rise is just not possible. I mean, the real problem is the human impacts on the planet and the fact that every single, the largest, the largest contribution you can make to CO2 is to have a child because they're going to unavoidably use resources. So this is a big, big struggle. It's a big, big struggle. Now, some people will say that 
if you are able to develop countries, developing countries such as Japan, have a low birth rate. And once you have a birth rate, your population declines. And so maybe there's a way naturally to get a population decline by making sure everyone is prosperous. That is one. Huh? Like educating and educating women. Exactly. You don't want to. You don't want to have ten kids when, when you're educated and you have a job. You know. So, and in many poor countries, having a lot of children is is a is basically a form of retirement. It's you know the kids are going to take care of you. That's why you have a lot of kids too. So it's such a difficult yeah, debate. I mean, this is why I asked about models because on yeah. average in poor countries they yeah. drive less cars, they yeah. use less Amazon, yeah. they are not working with supercomputers. So, mm -hmm. is there any conversion between you know the rate of childbirth in poor countries and in rich countries in terms of the striking the balance? Because it's it's a more complicated question than the number of people, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Where where they are born and what type of resources they require or use throughout their life. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't talk about that aspect much about uh, sort of the carbon footprint per person, but uh, there's a stark difference between the US and Africa. So absolutely. Um, I think it's a debate we need to start engaging, but it's hard in this country in particular when we can't even have debates about immigration. <laughs> So, but yes, absolutely, it's part of the equation. Now, the SSPs take into account their models for population growth. So there are people who work on demographics. It's not my field at all, but they do take into account projections for population growth. So that is folded into account. Is the overall population already going, plateauing or going down? I've seen various different numbers on that. The latest numbers I remember that we're probably expected to reach that it might plateau and turn around 10, 10 or 11 billion. Yeah. So there's still maybe 12 billion. But yeah. yeah uh, just a uh, comment. So um, ESO, the European Southern Territory, now has a sustainability office mm -hmm. as part of the observatory. Um, and I'll, I'll, a couple of months ago, I was at a talk by the new sustainability officer of ESO, who's the former representative of ESO in Chile, Claudio Melo, the Brazilian astronomer. And something that, a plot that he was showing in that presentation that I think comes from the same group that makes this kind of uh, bounce, uh, yeah. the sixth bounce, yeah. uh, was a plot that was showing kind of quality of living, quantified in some ways, versus how many bounds each country has kind of crossed or held cross. Uh, and the point that he was making was basically that it's like a huge correlation and there's no present examples of countries that would have what Westerns would call, you know, good quality of living and low climate impact, mm. right? So, uh, so it's a big conundrum, right? Yeah. Uh, it's like basically the point of like there's no way around. Yeah, you can't live like we want to live. Uh -huh. um, so and changing that is it seems such a you know challenge. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need a lot more thinking and discussion about modernity and what kind of lifestyle we want to lead and where that balance might be. I mean, when I look around and look at our modern lifestyle. It, it's not necessarily that great. We drive a bunch, it's pollution, trying to constantly avoid overeating, you know, like a lot of stress for work and childcare is terrible. It's not, it's not great, you know? <laughs> and so I can, I can think of many other different scenarios where, you know, I think of my grandparents who worked on a farm, they had hard physical labor, but in many ways, maybe their lives were better. And um, so I think this is a discussion to have. The problem is we need to talk about it very fast and start thinking about it. But yes, uh, how do we change our lifestyles um, is the big elephant in the room. Okay. 
case, then uh, thanks, Alexia. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>